Let's see, we've kind of had uh, quite a long excursion in this um, topic of optimizing and then optimizing just functions, uh, optimization problems. Then we talked about uh, dynamical systems, right? And uh, we've, we've used all along, you know, uh, the computer for helping us. Uh, lately we have uh, developed some kind of um, merge between the two, so we optimize certain things in a dynamical system. So I want to go back and uh, um, talk a little bit more about pretty much um, simulation of the dynamical systems that we've talked about, a continuous and discrete. But as you'll see, the even the continuous dynamical system that we're going to be uh, we, we've been talking about when you when you ask it on a computer, it's actually discretizing it. So, so in a way, I think about this chapter as being um, the connection between continuous and discretization of the continuous dynamical systems. Uh, the first example, well, maybe maybe I should say um, what I mean by that. So, so let me talk a little bit about discretization. of continuous dynamical systems for the purpose of of um, simulating them on digital computers and uh, certainly so this will require numerical methods and not uh, symbolic methods. Okay, so so the whole thing is is would like to um, you know pretend that we don't have any symbolic capabilities and we just. Um, ask computers to solve our problems, well, to help us solve the problems, similarly the, 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 the dynamical system. So, so if I start with a continuous time, dynamical system, that means, well, an autonomous system, dynamical system, and of course it's continuous, What does it mean, continu continuous? Good try. It means that, that the variables continuously depend on on parameter on the on the variable which is uh, on the on the time, the independent variable, right? So, so it's a continuous function. Um, well, I guess the word continuous comes from the fact that it runs over a continuous range of of, of times, right? Now, um, this can, I mean, this, you know, you can get philosophical about it, but uh, a lot of our, of our uh, processes that we observe actually run continuously in time, right? But when we observe it, or we make observations or experiments, we can never do this in a continuous fashion, right? So we always have to think of it as discrete times. So, And of course when you put it on a computer you also need to only simulate discrete times. Okay, So, um, so the main question is how to discretize time. And, um, well, in time. Okay? So, if I'm talking about, let's say, two variables, let's say x is a function, is a, has two components, two variables, right? then what you have is, let's say if you have a trajectory, you have an initial condition here and you have some you know, curve that fits the direction field, okay? and the direction field again is 
So capital F here it has its own has has two components, right? We don't necessarily put arrows. Maybe F and G or F1 and F2. Okay, so for the continuous problem, to solve this, it means that we uh, follow a curve that is tangent to this vector field, right? Given by the right hand side. And this is if it's autonomous or non autonomous. The difference between non, uh, these, these two cases is if it's autonomous, then the, the vector field is just fixed for all times, right? So it's, you can see it. Well, in two dimensions, three dimensions, and so forth. Uh, if it's if it's non-autonomous, it's going to change in time. So, but still, your curve is just fitting that direction uh, vector field, right? But as I said, what you uh, do when you do, you know, when you simulate on a computer or something, then you just um, you can only kind of record a discrete, uh, you know, discrete amount of times or time uh, discretized. So you can you can start with time t naught, t one, t two, and so forth. Right. The question is the the big question, which I don't know, million dollar question is, how can you ask the computer to actually jump, you know, so solve from, let's say you've solved until time t1. How can you guess the, the state of the system at, uh, you know, another time t2, which is, is greater than t1. So, so, so how, do you, how can you guess that, that value, right? And the, in general, you cannot. I mean, unless you solve it somehow explicitly, then you won't be able to find this exact value, right? You'll find an approximate value. So, so, there, are, so the, there are various methods, and you've, you've seen some of them, so I'll, um, we'll, we'll talk about uh, one or two today. Um, is, so at the end step, you're trying to find an approximation. I'm going to use capital X sub n that approximates, right? Can I get away? Uh, can I uh, stop putting errors? I'm going to stop doing errors. Otherwise, it gets too messy. So, so that approximates a solution at time t n, right? The question is, what should be an approximation for the solution at time t n? Okay. So, uh, simplest method, and of course the most kind of least effective, but it's the simplest to write, is the Euler's method. <coughs> okay. So you've probably seen it in for a single equation ordinary differential equation, but for system it's exactly the same thing. So the idea is the following. Uh, I'm going to blow up this. So the idea is if I know the solution at some time, let's call it Tn, and of course we don't know this so I, I drew this line, but it, we don't know the exact solution. We're trying to find out the exact solution. Um, so the idea is that you can follow. So let's say this is a f this is what f at x n looks like. So this is the this is the vector representing by the right hand side of that of that system at x n, right? Then the idea is to take a fraction of this and call this xn plus 1. So I'm going to use this xn here, and this is xn plus 1. Okay, and what fraction of this, of this vector we're going to take? So, uh, well, here's the, in words, um, sorry, the x dx dt and put a time tn 
we're going to approximate this with a uh, with a, um, just a finite difference or, or a different quotient, difference quotient. So this is x t n plus one minus x of t n over t n plus one minus t n. Okay. So first, we're going to pick the time step, so this is going to be the, we're going to decide on how, at what times we're going to make the approximation. And let's say it's a constant for all times. So, so in other words, there's going to be t0. The next one, t1, is t0 plus h. What's the next time step? Uh, the next time is going to be t2 is t0 plus 2h. Tn is T0 plus NH, right? Just to simplify this a little bit, so uh, so then the denominator here becomes H and the numerator becomes um, well, what it is. So so here's the idea: is to approximate um, the differential equation or the solution of the differential equation using this scheme. So xn plus 1 minus xn divided by h equals f of xn. And again, I'm, I'm suppressing the arrows. So let's see, why is this, why is this uh, formula kind of giving you that picture? Right? So, obviously you can rewrite this xn plus 1 to be what? xn plus h f of xn. Right? So then you see that uh, the, vec the, the point xn plus 1 <coughs> is obtained from the point xn plus this fraction of the actual vector f at xn. Okay. Okay. That's, so that's in, 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 in any number of dimension. You can have x being a vector of any size, of any, any number of variables. Um, now you've probably seen this in, in one dimension, so um, just to um, connect it with what you've seen in one dimension, so in 1D, so that's x is just a function, I don't know, a little x of, of t, right, one component. Uh, you can you can actually do a better job at representing this scheme by plotting x versus time. Okay. Um, so let's say t zero is here. And let's say you go, you know, it has you've done t one and now you're at t n and you want to do t n plus one. So all of these are equidistant if you want. So same, same, uh, same, same way. Um, so I didn't talk about the, well, I didn't talk about initial conditions there, but obviously you have to start with something, some, some uh, initial condition x naught, and then you just iterate that process. So it's the same here. Let's say that x naught is uh, is, you know, this is the value at time t naught. Then at time t1 is this much, right? And then you you have found the value xn at time tn. And again, this doesn't have to go in a straight line, obviously. So maybe I'll just force this to go down and then up and then whatever, right? So 
the, the move from xn to xn plus 1 is done such that what happens? The slope of this line is I guess I can write this uh, even uh, instead of capital F I'm going to write it as little f just one component right so it's f at x n right okay so it's the slope and uh, how, how far does it go well you know what tn plus one is so 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 it goes all up up to this value and then that's where we find the x n plus one okay but I think to me, I think it's better to think in, in, in two dimensions or three dimensions, you know, um, because it just, you know, so it's better to think of it as as a moving in the direction of the of the of the vector field, but at a fraction of the of the actual vector field, and the fraction is is this time step. Okay. And by the way, um, if you want to uh, find good approximations for our continuous uh, solution of the continuous system, h h has to be small, right? So that so that uh, the derivative gets a good you know gets a good approximation with that difference quotient. Okay, so that's. Uh, that's kind of how you derive, say, the first or the simplest uh, discretization of that continuous dynamical system. And if you look at it as a, you know, uh, knowing what h is, if you look at that s of, the, of that equation, then you see exactly a. What do we call this? No linear because f is still the same. We haven't done any linearization. It's an iteration. Just an iteration. So it's just a discrete dynamical system, right? Right. But it has that little little extra h there, which is um, which needs to be given a priori. So um, Okay, so basically the discretization of a continuous uh, dynamical system leads to um, a discrete dynamical system of the type that we've 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 studied. So um, when I write this. Delta x n equals f of x n. This is a discrete time dynamical discrete time dynamical system um, where h is taken to be one. If h is not one, so in general, you would just have this. You would have delta x n over delta t equals f of x n, right? So h is delta t. Okay, and uh, I should I should mention that of course this is not the only um, scheme. So so there are other much better uh, discretizations methods, and let's see. So there is a so-called implicit. There, there are many. I'm not going to talk about most of them. There's implicit uh, Euler methods. Um, uh, implicit Euler is saying that to compute the, the new the new state or the new 
uh, the value of the solution or approximate solution at the new time step. Uh, you do this, so you start with the old one, and then you solve. sort of an implicit equation. So, so instead of going in the direction of the vector field, a fraction of the vector field at xn, you go at uh, the fraction of the vector field at xn plus 1, which you don't know, right? Because you're trying to solve. So, so this equation actually requires you to solve a nonlinear equation for xn plus 1, possibly a nonlinear equation for, for xn plus 1. That's why it's called implicit, right? How would you solve this equation? For xn plus 1. How would you, how would you instruct a computer to, knowing xn, so let me show you the picture on, on um, just, one dimension. So in one dimension you so you know basically well you know where you are at you are at at time Tn right and you wanna figure out where you need to be at time Tn plus one. So you see you basically have to shoot for a point where what happens? where the slope of the direction field matches with this with this line, right? So to to contrast with the explicit, this was explicit because the oops. Here you were you, you knew where you were at time Tn, you knew what the slope you know you know you knew the direction to go and you just went there, right? Whereas here, you don't know the slope that you need to, to take, right? So you have to kind of, who knows, maybe the, the slopes are arranged like this, right? <coughs> then you have to kind of probe and see which direction can I, can I go. Now, again, this is implicit, so it requires solving solving um, nonlinear system at each iteration, but but and this uh, can be quite scary, right? I mean, first of all, you may not be able to do it uh, explicitly for sure. On a computer, what can you do? How do you how do we solve nonlinear systems? is, I mean, all, all I'm saying is I have some sort of, and G may not be the, you may have seen G in different contexts, but all I'm doing is I'm, I'm having an expression involving Xn plus 1 and Xn, of course, but Xn is known, right? How do you solve for Xn plus 1 from such, a, from such an equation? I'm not asking the question right or so uh, let me give an example here um, let's say you want to solve well if I give an example it's going to be very explicit um, I don't know let's let's take 1d one dimension right so I'm having the following I'm giving you this x prime equals f of x what uh, 1 minus x squared I don't know okay how does it look on an explicit Euler so it's just a simple Euler method uh, 
or maybe not maybe maybe x minus x squared let's let's do this it doesn't really matter okay what's the Euler's method uh, what's the instruction you give the computer to uh, solving the Euler's method say so xn plus 1 equals xn plus h times xn minus I'm going to put subscripts here. Minus x and squared, right? And you can you can just iterate this, right? How about implicit Euler? It would be x n plus one equals x n. I don't know, let me let's say two point five here, so it doesn't look like you can solve it by hand, right? So x n plus h times xn plus 1 minus xn plus 1 to the power 2.5 okay so now I give you x naught and I'm asking find x1 how do you find x1 or I'm giving you xn how do you find xn plus 1 You have to use some sort of numerical technique for solving. You try to find n plus one with n, with itself. Well, you're trying to solve an, uh, a nonlinear equation, right? Yeah. So, what do we do? What do we say we, we we have to do? I mean, unless we have some symbolic, no, powerful symbolic computation uh, capabilities, but except uh, that case, this you'd have to do a Newton's method or something, something, right? So. So it's not it's not impossible, and keep in mind that Newton's method, for instance, for approximating, you know, a zero of some nonlinear function like this, right? You put everything in one side, you call that the function g, and then you apply Newton's method to that, um, and you run. You don't have to run like a, a million steps, right? It can be just well, you have to have a good guess, right? But the point is that each time iteration, at each n at each time iteration, you're going to have to do something significant, okay? Like doing 20 steps of a Newton's method, right? And starting sufficiently close to the solution. And that's, keep in mind, that's just to find how to move from xn to xn plus 1. Okay, but there are other advantages. Uh, so this is a disadvantage, of course, but there are other advantages that actually make this um, make this scheme um, you know just a possible possible scheme but implicit methods are are, are typically um, require this extra dimension extra step in between uh, in between time steps okay and there are uh, others there's so-called improved Euler Yeah, we're going to get there. Just, just a second. So, so you've you've heard of this, and again, if you've seen them on systems, then you don't see anything new here. But, and if you don't, if you didn't see them from systems, these are just the same tools as you did for um, for um, for the um, for, for 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 single equations. Yeah, exactly. First order single equations. So, so this improved order, for instance, is, is the following. So it says, take the new, the current value x n, and then uh, do like an average. So h times, but instead of now taking the um, just the either f of xn or f of xn plus 1 you can do f of xn plus and here's the uh, you could do f of xn plus 1 but that this would give an implicit scheme right that means you'd have to still do something in between uh, time steps so instead of that so instead of xn plus 1 what could you do here? You could put 
xn plus hf of xn. So you would, okay, I mean, of course, when you just write it down, it's hard to see that it's doing anything good other than uh, making a, a, an average between two, two values of the vector field. Okay, but it turns out this is actually uh, better, and of course I should say Tn. It's always the case that Tn plus 1 is Tn plus H. So, so these are fixed time steps. Fi fixed steps. Um, fixed, fixed time step um, methods. But they're, they're also with a variable time step. Okay? And uh, Rangakata, of course, are um, the more popular type of, of discretizations here. And let's see, so the uh, so th there is a second order Rangikara. So these are names of two mathematicians. Um, so let's see. So this has, is going to uh, be done in two steps. So first step is, I'm sorry, and sometimes I put the superscript, sometimes subscripts. I try to stay with superscripts. Um, so xn plus one half h f of xn. So you go like half the time, and you compute something like an ex with an explicit scheme, right? So this would be an expl this is the original orders method, but with only half half the h. And then you call this something. No, traditionally you call it n plus a half because you're like a t n plus plus a half. Okay. So you just give it a name. You store this value, and then you compute. Uh, the true value xn to be, uh, excuse me, xn plus 1 to be xn plus uh, the value, uh, excuse me, h times f, that's capital F, at um, xn plus a half. And again, I'm only doing this for uh, for aut autonomous systems, so so the it doesn't have any any explicit time dependence. But of course, there's something with time dependence too. I mean, the, if if f would have time dependence, then this will be a there will be a time t n plus a half going here. Okay. Let's see. I think one of the homework questions I have uh, for you asks you to to look at this fourth order Rangakara, which um, so let's let's it's kind of the most popular one. And in fact P plane P plane, the one you've been playing with, by default has that um, fourth order Rangakara. So but in order to rewrite Rangakara, fourth order Rangakara, let's let's rewrite the second order uh, as follows. So, so think about what are the steps re required to to do that uh, jump from t from uh, time n to time n plus one. So you can split it, or you can systemize it, as, uh, make it more systematic, as follows. Now, so is the following: is h times f of x n. Okay, so you compute this quantity, right? This is going to be a vector. You agree? So f was a vector, so it's going to be a vector times h. So that's basically that fraction. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take um, k two to be h times f at x n plus one half k one. Okay. 
it looks a little bit uh, weird that we do it like this but it helps for the next one so and then the scheme is xn plus 1 is xn plus what? k2 okay okay so again doesn't make much sense to write like this but fourth order Rangel Kata now is going to become so fourth order is going to become more um, clear when we write like this so we write we write k1 equals h f of xn k2 is h f at x n plus one half k one by the way this this is also in your book so uh, the fourth order so you can what page is on in the homework part, so to, uh, page 214. Alright. Uh, so K3 is H times F at x n plus one half k two. So notice that the second and the third steps are different. I mean, it's not a repetition, right? You need to compute k two before you compute k three, and also you need to compute k three before you compute k four, which is h f at x n plus k three. So. <clears throat> Okay, so this is just kind of to, yeah. I have a question about what you did just a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, when you rewrote the second order, mm -hmm. a little bit higher, at the top there, how did you make that jump uh, from x to m plus 1 half to m plus 1? I mean, I don't know, could you explain that further, how you got to that? You mean from here to here? No, 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 the very top one to the second order. Oh, you mean? Well, okay. So I didn't show you how how this method, how this uh, how this second order Rangakara is derived. I just don't see how you went from n plus one half to also n plus one. Well, forget the n plus one half. It's just put it a star there. So that's just kind of a quantity. The first line just defines a quantity that actually is is fed in the second one, right? So in essence, you could just forget that it's n plus one half. Just just take that quantity and put it in the inside F and just read that line, right? Oh, you didn't, you didn't take X to the N plus one half and derive the next one, you just use that result in the second equation? Yes. So I didn't... Uh, it looked like you, you somehow changed one half from times H and it became H. If you did some sort of algebra... I didn't do any algebra. This is the scheme. Okay. The one half, the h over one half, does, it's not a part of the... Uh, it's, it's in other words... So, so, okay, so in other words, here is just basically this. Sn plus 1 is xn plus h f of xn plus one half h f of x n. Oh, All there is. Okay.
Okay, but again, we, we split it like this so that, that you can, uh, you, you see that when, when you start looking at the fourth order, it's, and I, I still, you know, I still haven't told you what xn plus 1 is, right? So now I need to tell you what xn plus 1 is. Is xn plus 1 sixth k1 plus 2k2 plus 2k3 plus k4. Okay. So where where all these quantities are are computed, you know, previously. So yeah. Uh, exactly. So so I'm not I haven't uh, I haven't really derived these schemes, but you can see some oddities. So there there are some there are some coefficients here. You know, this is like one. This is like one half, one half, and the, the one above is zero, right? right. And then there is this one six, one third, one third, one six, right? So, so these are not by all means the only ways you can actually create this discretizations, but th these are turn out to be kind of the most popular ones, right? I mean, most commonly used ones. Um, now, so again, I'm not going to talk too much about. I mean, a numerical um, course sort of goes into the derivation of these things. Um, this has something to do with trapezoidal rule. If, if I mean, I could. Uh, if there is a big demand, I can actually go through this if you want. Uh, how how they get derived. Um, so maybe just I'm just going to say one word here. So the idea is that you you take this and you write it as a, as an integral. Equation instead of differential equation, you write as you integrate basically. T naught, let's say T naught is zero, just just to be. Um, then it's f of x of s ds, and then it's um, it's basically using uh, the approximating an integral with trapezoidal rule, or Simpson's rule, or you know uh, numerically basically integrating this. This term that leads to expressions like that, right? Weighted averages of of values of eight. But right in the end, the k's, you see the k1, k2, k3, k4 are just values of f, right? So you can see that uh, it's not. It's still not very clear why you have to do it like that. But but again, it's that's the idea coming from. Okay, so that's. Uh, one of the most popular one, and again, I, if you haven't noticed um, in p-plane, that you should definitely go back and 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 um, check this. That you can actually choose different methods. I'm not sure if p-plane has it or no, p-plane doesn't have it. You see, p-plane, I think by default it uses. You can change it. Oh, you can change it somewhere. After you, after you do proceed. Okay, so let me just take a Thunder Paul or something. Okay, so you see this, and now in options here. Yeah, thank you. So, so there are there are other ones. Rangakara four is is kind of right on top here. Um, so I guess it, by default it uses a Dorman pr Prince, which is. Also a popular tool, but you see, um, I think one uh, OD two three that's Rangakara two. This one, okay. And again, you don't. Uh, it doesn't show you. And of course, you have to kind of uh, tweak things around. But it doesn't show you what the scheme does. But that's that's what implemented in the code. So. Um, so what we're going to do in this. Um, in this chapter is basically get used to, I mean, try to uh, think of this method for systems, okay? If you've seen it for, for single equations, uh, now it's, it's thinking about, it's uh, looking at it for systems. So if you look at, uh, for instance, this code, which is whale problem. Um, let me just show you where the code is, the relevant code. So first of all, we're talking about 
small. I don't know if you can see. It's kind of small. Um, we're talking about competing species, right? And again, this this is just to, to see the direction field. And remember, this direction field is not is scaled already. I mean, it's so to see anything, uh, you know, uh, these are not the actual lengths, right? But it's an indication of where things go. You can do, uh, you know, equilibria and all this. Um, and what we want to do is we want to simulate this uh, for final time 200, right? Initial condition 5,000, 70,000. So 5,000 blue whales and 70,000 fin whales. Okay? And the time step is what you have to pick, okay? Now, we picked to be equal to 1 so that, well, which is comparably small to, to 200 years, right? So this is this, we're talking about 200 years. So let's say H is 1, so if you, if you pick H1, and see, uh, you can run and see what happens, and then you change H, right? So uh, this is the loop, basically, where we use this explicit Euler, right? Now keep in mind, X is a vector, two components, right? So right-hand side is going to be a vector, right? Nothing symbolic here. Okay, alpha is given as a number. Uh, and you just plot. Now, this in MATLAB to plot basically to connect the previous one with the new one. That's probably you've seen this command already. So, um, and then then in the loop it just it doesn't remember the previous values, right? The values that are computed. It kind of always overwrites. So the only thing that's left out of this is the plot. Okay. And of course, the final value. So when it's done, uh, the final value. And I think we have the plot here, so you can see it. OK, so it's kind of small. Um, we can run this code. But so what's the significance of these points here? At the end of each year, or after each AH, uh, so at each time time iteration, uh, it has gone in the direction of the direction in the direction of the vector field by that fraction, right? Now, the smaller the H, the better it's going to be the uh, the fit with the you know as a continuous curve to to the direction field. So it's going to be the better and better approximation for the continuous problem. And uh, let's see, so. And it should, uh, and it, 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 right, so, exactly. So the, the question is, where is this thing going? Well, being a nonlinear system, it's kind of, various things can happen, right? But uh, we can see, right, from the simulation that it's actually approaching, well, you can zoom in there and, and see that it's actually getting, closer and closer to some steady state, right? And in fact, you can find the steady state. You have the right-hand side set equal to zero, right? So it's just like in the continuous system. Uh, and you can see that that's a stable equilibrium, so asymptotically stable, in fact. So if you're getting you know, close enough to that, then you're going to be sucked in there, right? Um, and there's another plot that's kind of important to, to make, which is versus time, of both species versus time, OK? Remember, that previous plot doesn't show you the evolution versus time. It just shows you the evolution of one species against the other in time. But it doesn't say, like, you don't know how long it takes unless you count the, the dots, right? How many dots, how, many, how much time it took to get to, I don't know, to something, right? Remember, that's the face portrait. It doesn't show you the temporal evolution. So, but of course, you, and this is kind of ridiculous that I did another uh, loop there. Of course, you can do everything in one loop, but I just wanted to. Uh, so in this second loop, we do the same thing, but except now, instead of 
writing over the, you know, uh, the old values and just leaving the plot, what do we do here? We actually store everything, right? So, of course, once you store, so how, what's this x equals x, x? x is a column, right? The, the, the little x. Capital X is, is actually going to be a column that after the first iteration is going to be two columns, then three columns, and so forth. So it's basically just augments, right? So one by two augmented Little x. Uh, two by one. Two by one, and then, then, then it's going to keep adding the columns, which are the computed values of x. So in the end, you just have everything. So, so you can plot the first row of that two by whatever, and the first row uh, plotted against time is going to give you the blue whale, right? And then the fin whales. Now, why did I pick 200? Well, you kind of try, right? It's like plotting. You, when you plot, you, you choose a window size, right? So here, t 200 is relevant because of what reason? You know, this, this fin population was actually st stabilized much, looks like. It, it has found its peak like around 100 years, right? But you see the, the blue whale is still kind of going up. So, I don't know, maybe we should have gone 300 and then see kind of a plateau. Yeah. Um, again, depending on the problem, uh, you might need to uh, augment this by some some uh, factor which which would scale this. So if you look in the quiver, help for quiver, and one of the solutions that I gave, right? Uh, I couldn't make it myself. So it depends on the problem, typically. Does M your M The, 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 oh yeah, oh, you mean here? Yeah. yeah. So you can, you can impact your error by changing M. So sure, that too. Yeah, but if M is too large, it's going to be look like a forest. Um, <laughs> look, the, the, uh, the reality is you don't even have to plot these things. Right? I mean, in the end, if it's three-dimensional, you're not going to want to plot vector fields in three dimensions, right? But you need to know wh where it comes from. So, if it's if it looks uh, pretty fine, if not, that's that's still fine, right? So we're not okay. So keep in mind that this is also an essential kind of feature in this is trying is is seeing you know besides just the uh, what happens with one species against the other is what happens with with each species in time. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can show you this one really quick. So this one is uh, RLC circuit and I'm going I don't remember how much we spent on this a little bit. Yeah. So uh, okay so basically just look at these two lines and this is this is the system right? So the system has a parameter C which capacity whatever. Um, so this is actually the van der Poel, right? It's like the van der Poel that I showed you earlier there. Uh, x1 minus x1 cubed minus x2 and x1 over c. It may be a little bit uh, different values, but yeah, see? So, so you can actually use this different values for m and put a c here and you're going to get the same picture. Okay. Oh, by the way, if, sometimes if the face, if the direction field doesn't look right with arrows, try with lines. With lines, you're going to lose the direction, directionality. So, okay. So that's that's what I have here, and of course that's what uh, uh, this one is too, right? So again, what are we what are we doing here? We're trying to. Well, instead of just blindly use p plane, right? Which which does exactly the same thing as we do. 
uh, but in much more efficient way. And by the way, it uses variable time step. So it's it's much it's much more optimized so that when it doesn't need a small time step, it doesn't use a time, but when it needs a small time step, when there's like a sharp you know, change, uh, turn or something, then it would actually change that. So, um, right, so again, look at the code. Uh, H was chosen to be point, uh, point 0.1. Capital N is what? Well, it says there. Number, okay, is number of iterations, right? So it's it, and it's computed as taking the final time divided by the time step. Floor is just doing a, making an integer. Okay, but again the key the key line is this one right, which is explicit Euler. Okay, if you feel like really powerful, um, you should change the line to do like an implicit Euler, which of course is gonna right. You're gonna instead of one line, you're gonna have to do something. At each time, at each at each uh, run of this iteration, or improve that, or something, right? I mean, or run Gekata. You can just take that line out and put four or five lines, right? And I will give you a Gekata. I think that's one of your homework. Um, not necessarily for for this code, but okay. So that's uh, that's that's kind of the basic of discretizing. Let me. Um, let me show you something interesting. I mean, this this is actually more interesting. So, I'm gonna pick on the RLC. So, if I take this code and I just put it in uh, MATLAB, RLC Euler. Ooh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So you see, it's. Uh, Better than that that uh, published version. Um, okay, so I just want to show you what happens if you if you take um, a, a larger time step, right? So point one is it turns out that it's actually reproducing the that cycle, right? So remember in that well. You have no way of knowing, but you saw it in the p plane. There was some something like a cycle, right? That's the oscillator, oscillating behavior. But if you do this um, with a course with kind of a big time steps, like big jumps, you start at the same point, but you see, you follow you follow f that bigger fraction of the vector field, right? So you're like, from the get-go, you're too far from, from, from being approximating the, 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 the continuous problem. And of course, then because the first step was so bad, you know, everything's bad. So, so there's a lot of, um, I mean, there's a, it's, a, it's a huge field, of course. Um, for a very simple and good reason is that with a computer, you cannot. Um, I mean, you know the state at this point. You're trying to find the state at in two seconds. If you don't solve it exactly, you know, if you don't follow that trajectory exactly, how can you know how to advance? So these these methods are actually, um, you know, trying to to do a better and better job. Uh, of course, everybody would say to make the approximation better, just make h really, really small, right? If you make h really, really small, you're going to make, make n really, really big. So this, you saw, it took it took more uh, longer time to to run this, right? Uh, of course, you could say, well, I'm just going to do a hundred iterations. But if I do 100 iterations and I make engage really small, what's going to happen? You're just going to go a little bit, right? So there's there's always trade-offs here, and and um, you ought to take my other course, 
which which does numerical solutions of PDs to see uh, how, how much uh, more hairy it, g it gets there. But it's the same thing. It's like, do I want a really fine you know, resolution in time for a good solution? Not, not always, because then you're going to wait forever to get a solution um, to, be, to be doing anything uh, significant. OK, so that's, um, that's what I want. And, and I had one, a third code that I'm going to show you, and maybe just finish early today. Um, oh yeah, so um, I don't know, you you probably saw how many different possibilities of you know, modeling situations you can uh, encounter just from what we've talked so far. But this one I think is the first example in chapter 6 is something like a war problem. A uh, war problem has basically gosh, my uh, Typing is terrible, right? It's not dynamic. It's dynamic system. Um, so this code, and again, if you run, if you look at the, if you look at the example, basically you have two armies, red and blue, I believe. Um, each is is uh, uh, measured by like number of soldiers or something, right? Um, and and then there is some sort of uh, dynamical system, but it's a discrete dynamical system from the from the beginning. So so we're not doing anything uh, discretizing some continuous dynamical system, right? This just basically says that um, the change in so it's bit, maybe I should write this down. So C will and RLC examples for Euler's method. Okay, and the last one is um, basically simulation of discrete dynamic discrete time dynamical systems. And by the way, this was also in your exam, if you didn't notice. Um, hmm? You've noticed? Okay, good. That's good. Um, now, of course, you had something else to do there. I mean, it wasn't uh, really simulating um, this thing. So you do kind of analysis, you know, uh, of, of the discrete dynamic system. But here, um, it's saying, and again, there's there's going to be some parameters. Um, right, it's just saying that uh, is it each day? No, each hour, each hour, right? So it's like an hourly update. Uh, it says the change in. The red army or blue army, I forgot which one is the X1 is. Red army, okay? So the red army uh, kind of decreases if there is uh, proportional to the, uh, to the, uh, up to the uh, blue army, right? And then there is some sort of, also some sort of interaction um, between the two armies. So there's a term modeling that. Same with the, with the other army and the possible um, parameters. So the parameters are um, have some meaning. And so they're they're considered to be positive. Okay. So I'll let you kind of look through this. And of course, uh, they can be uncorrelated, but uh, I think one assumption early on is that um, A1 is a, scale, a constant multiple of A2, or lambda times A2, and B1 is lambda times B2.
Uh, and I see, what, what was the meaning of lambda? Let's do the efficiency of one or the other um, armies, but that, that doesn't quite, um, it's not so important at this point. So, okay, so basically what you have is you have a discrete time dynamical system with an initial, uh, uh, an initial data, so x1 and x2 at time zero is given. And then the question is analyze um, the dynamics of the system for different choices of the parameters. Okay, and that's what this um, code does. So let's see. So if you follow my example, then everything is kind of in one big loop. But it doesn't. You don't have to do it like that. So for instance. Uh, the values of lambda are all chosen in this array, in this row, right? So it's 1, 1 1.5, 2, 3, 5, and 6. And then this is one big loop, basically for all, uh, for, for each, you know, for each value of lambda it does the same thing. Uh, it has some fixed values for the other parameters, right? And then it just kind of uh, plots, plots things, and then computes things. So, what's the only peculiar feature in this code is there's a while loop. What is a while loop? It's basically testing when, <coughs> for the condition when both, in this case, are positive. Because if 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 one is stops being positive, it means it's gone, um, and then it stops. You, you, there's no reason of, of pursuing in the other quadrants, right? So that's basically this thing, and then, but you see here, it's just basically, this is the one key line again, okay? And then, then at the end of this, it, it says if, if x1 uh, is the one that is positive while the x2 is zero, then the winner is, and so forth, right? So, so let's see what comes out to this. It comes out to be, So there are all these runs, right? Lambda equals one gives you this run. And you see it has n runs, uh, excuse me, nine runs, I mean nine iterations. In the ninth iteration, the blue army goes negative, right? For different values of, of the parameter, it may take longer, but still the blue army is, is losing after 10 iterations, 11 hours, right? Whatever. Um, 12 hours, 18 hours. So lambda, lambda has this meaning of slows the attrition. Slows the attrition of the of the blue army, right? Yeah. And the blue army was the second one. So lambda came in the first one. Um, Although it looks like it's increasing the attrition of the red army. Red right. The, uh, the longer in, in hours, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Right. And then, then, but but it's true that it, the blue army, the red army wins, but but with less, uh, you know, survivors, I guess. Um, and then you see for lambda equals six, it actually switches to the other one. Right. And visually, this is uh, you have you have them in the book as well. There's a problem with the book. Uh, the the plots, the plots that you see in this chapter are like, uh, you'll find plots three pages after the problem is all... So you're talking about totally different problems, but seeing the, the old plots. So, be, you know, it's kind of confusing. So just kind of look at this, and I think you can start working on the homework. I have, I have to mention the first problem in the homework. It, it deals with this war problem. And it asks you to do kind of a run for two different types of parameters. So you'll have a lambda, which has six values and a, and a W which has six values. Okay, what does that mean? This means you're going to have 36 runs. Please don't don't make a pen print out of that. So I'll, I'll I'll mention more on on Wednesday, but don't, just don't print it yet. 
But I want to just tabulate. I mean, just in a table, say who wins, depending on the yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.